Good morning. It's really good to be here. It's really good to be back with you uh, after a couple of weeks off and just to be back among the church family. If you're uh, here as a guest or visiting, you're really welcome. If you're here uh, for not the first time, I hope you feel uh, a warm welcome and, and good fellowship as we join together to uh, worship. A couple of announcements just to make before we begin our time of worship together. Um, the Free Food Friday table will continue uh, this Friday and then right throughout the summer as it has been doing. A big thanks to those who and they've been helping out with that over the last uh, number of weeks. That's been great to be able to, to carry that on in, in July and August as well. So I'll be there from 9.30 onwards. No vouchers, nothing else needed. Just come and take whatever you can. And please uh, pass on the, the message to others as, as you have been doing um, as well. Um, our Holy Bible Club begins this week, begins on Monday. And that's for anyone from P1 to P7. We still have literally one or two spaces. So if you have any uh, nephews, nieces, grandchildren, neighbours, anybody else that you think uh, would enjoy coming along that, please do speak to me um, before tonight and we can uh, get that arranged. That's uh, Monday or Friday, 10 until 12 for those in P1 uh, to P7. We're also going to have some youth nights. We're going to have them uh, on Monday, Wednesday and Friday. And that's for those aged 11 um, to 16. And again, there are spaces um, for that. Please just let me know if anyone uh, is hoping to come along to that. Please do also keep that work in prayer and um, during uh, the week and I'll say a little bit more about that as we come up to our prayers of intercession. Um, we're going to have an all age family service next Sunday and that'll be an opportunity for us to, to reflect on what's happened during the week and maybe give a little flavour um, to, to yourselves just to see what, what is going on and what we've thought about and talked about and shared um, during, during the week. And then finally the, uh, the last woman's walk of the summer will be on Thursday the 26th of August, so it's not this Thursday, but next please do uh, keep that uh, date free and we'll say a little bit more about that next Sunday, but the plan is that to walk from here uh, and back to the, the hall as well and to be able just to share some uh, refreshments and, and fellowship as well. That's next Thursday, the 26th of August. A call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 91. Let me read the first two verses from the Psalms. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Well, let's reflect that as we sing our opening praise, Jesus is Lord. It's hymn number 215, and Lord will be on the screen. Let's stand together as we praise God. Yeah.
Jesus is Lord. Those are three words that people like us have been saying and sharing and, and singing for centuries upon centuries, isn't it? Jesus is Lord. It's why we come. It's why we join together on this on the first day of the week. It's why we come to worship. It's why we come to meet together. And, and it's why we come to pray as well. Let, let's do that now as we have the opportunity. Let's pray again. Father God, we come to you in prayer this morning with those words of our call to worship still fresh in our minds. Lord, we thank you that they are words of encouragement to us. And we thank you that they also maybe come as words of challenge at times as well. Lord, we thank you that it is an encouragement for us as we join together here this morning to know that we can dwell in the shelter of the Most High. It's a help for us to be able to realise and to be reminded that we can rest in the shadow of the Almighty. Lord, what an amazing thing this is for us to know, for us to be told, for us even to remind ourselves of. And Father, it's better than any invitation that can come from, from anyone in this world, from any person or dignitary or celebrity or someone who's sought after someone that we look up to, someone that we prize. We thank you that it comes from the Most High, it comes from the Almighty. Father, thank you for the encouragement that, that this is as we think about drawing near to you this morning. And yet, Lord, we, we know that it also comes as a challenge to us. It makes us look inward and it makes us ask ourselves if we really are dwelling there if we really are resting so close to you that, that we are in your shadow. Or if we're like Adam and Eve in the garden and, uh, and we're not walking with you, we're not dwelling so closely, we're not resting beside you, but, but instead we're running and we're trying to hide. Lord, we know that it, it challenges us to think about just how closely we have walked with you even over these past days, even over this last week. Lord, forgive us for those times whenever we don't dwell with you, or whenever our minds and our interests are elsewhere. Lord, whenever we're not resting in you, whenever we're looking for all sorts of things to find our rest in. Lord, help us to examine ourselves. Lord, help us to be challenged by your word. Help us to know you that encouragement as well. Lord, this is the invitation that is open to us through Jesus, that we might know that Jesus really is Lord, that we can dwell with you and we can rest even in your shadow. Father, as we worship you this morning, help us to know even more that Jesus really is Lord, the Lord who was there when everything was made at creation, the Lord who is at your right hand now and reigns in heaven and will be forever and ever and ever. And help us to know that he is the Lord of our lives. Help us to know his lordship as we follow him, as we trust him, as we know that he cares for us, as we know that he intercedes for us, as we know that we can find rest in him. And Lord, because these things are true, we come together this morning and we worship. We gather to worship you. We gather to pray and we gather around your word. Father, as we do so, help us to know that Jesus is Lord. In his name we pray. Amen. We're going to turn uh, to read from God's Word now as we uh, turn to John uh, chapter 6. We're going to start a, a new series, um, the seven I Am sayings of Jesus that we find um, scattered throughout uh, the Gospel. If you have your Bibles with you, please do turn to John uh, chapter 6 and the words will also uh, be on the screen as we read from there. So John Chapter 6, and beginning at verse 22. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. 
Then they asked him, what must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, what sign then will you give us that we might see it and believe it? What will you do? Our ancestors hit the man in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to, him, said to them, Very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God, for the, sorry, for the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me and you still do not believe. All those the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of he who sent me. But I shall lose none of all those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life. And I will raise them up at the last day. Amen. We, we give thanks to God for, for his word to us. <clears throat> well just before the, the children have a, an opportunity to uh, go out to, to KFC and the creche, I, I want us to have a, a little uh, think about something this morning, something that I always enjoy about this summer. I'm just back from my summer holidays and, and there's one particular thing that I really enjoy about summer holidays and it's breakfast time. You know whenever you're at work and you're busy and you're doing things, you have to just kind of rush to have your breakfast, don't you? Maybe you just grab whatever's at hand, you eat it, and you don't think an awful lot about it. But maybe it says a lot about me, but what I really look forward to on holiday times is having a little bit more time for breakfast. Deciding what you want to eat, deciding what you're going to eat for breakfast. I want you to put your hand up and tell me what your favourite thing is for breakfast. And that's not just restricted to those who go going out to KFC or go with. But put your hand up and tell me what your favourite thing is for breakfast. I'll tell you mine later on, so don't, don't be shy. What's your favourite thing for breakfast? Yeah, Ethan, what's yours? Bacon? Oh, man, after my own heart. Brilliant. What, what would you have with your bacon? Some eggs. Okay, perfect. Excellent. That's a great start. James, what's your favourite breakfast? An apple. Very good. Takes all the healthy things after myself. That's right. You do have a green apple, don't you, for most days for breakfast. Great. So we have bacon, we have eggs, we have an apple. What else? What's anyone else's favourite? Some porridge. Oh, we're getting into the healthy things now. You're, you're making me look terrible. Okay. Coffee, okay. Coffee wakes Stephen up in the morning. Excellent. These are all really good things. Anyone else? Dave, I'm scared to ask. What's your favourite thing for Right, okay. Is that what May makes for you? Fried rice, okay, right. Any other sensible suggestions? Not from the other side of the, the church. One other thing, maybe. Tell us one other thing. Weedabix. Weedabix, excellent, okay, perfect. So some Weedabix, some uh, porridge, some coffee, some bacon, some eggs, and, and some fruit, maybe as well. Let me run through what I think are some really good things. And I've had all of these for breakfast, not necessarily at the same time during my summer holidays. Let's see. Oh, who else can I move? Go on the next slide. I'm not sure if this is moving up. Yeah, a full fry. Now, Ethan wasn't bad with bacon and egg. That was fair enough. But I think we need a little bit more sometimes, don't we? Maybe a couple of tomatoes, maybe a wee bit of potato bread hiding in there and uh, some, some black pudding as well. We'll not get into the debate about that, but we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll enjoy that. I really enjoy a nice fry for breakfast. Let's see what else is on the screen. Yes, we're feeling maybe a little bit continental. We're, we're on our holidays, maybe somewhere a little bit warmer. Or maybe a hotel, we're feeling a bit fancy. We might, we might enjoy a croissant or some pastries for breakfast. Yep, I've had that as well. But here, here is my most favourite breakfast uh, that I can think of. It is toast, peanut butter, and a little bit of sliced banana on top. 
Maybe that's put you in the mood for that, either for your supper on a Sunday night or breakfast tomorrow. But that is my favourite breakfast, probably out of them all. It's some toast, some peanut butter, and a little bit of banana on top as well. And you know, you know, whenever we think about it, we have lots of different types of bread for breakfast, don't we? Whenever we sit down to think about our breakfast, unless you're very healthy like some of these other people, it involves a lot of bread, doesn't it? Whether you're gonna have potato or soda bread on your Ulster fry, or maybe you're gonna have a croissant or some pastries, or you're just gonna have some toast with nice things on it. We tend to have lots and lots of bread, don't we, at breakfast time, and maybe even throughout the day. And you know, it's a really good way to start the day because it, it helps to fill us up, doesn't it? It helps to, to see us through. It helps to, to satisfy our hunger. But you know, whenever we stop to think about it, it's not all that long before we're eating again, is it? It's not all that long before we're thinking about mm, what else is in the fridge or what is in the cupboard or what are we going to have for lunch. And if we make it through your lunchtime with our breakfast, we're probably doing not too bad, aren't we? But imagine, imagine there's a type of breakfast. Imagine there was a type of bread that was on offer and you were told if you have this you'll not be hungry again. If you have this you'll not need anything else. I reckon that would be a really really popular thing to have for breakfast wouldn't it? If someone made that promise, if someone made that offer I think that's exactly what you would take, exactly what you would have. Well today we are starting to think about the first of seven really important things that Jesus said about himself. Seven pictures that he gives us that helps us to know who he is. Seven pictures that we can easily have on our mind and remember and understand. And the first picture that Jesus gives us, the first thing that he tells us about himself is this. He says, I am the bread of life. See, just before he told us this, just before he told us, crowds of people who were there that day to be able to hear him. He fed people. He fed people in a really miraculous way. I'm sure we all remember, we all know the story of how he did that. He had five little loaves and he had two small fish and he fed thousands of people with these few things. And so Jesus does this great miracle for this great amount of people. But there's a problem. And the problem is what we heard a little bit of from our reading in John's Gospel. The problem is that Jesus said that lots of people who were there that day, or maybe lots of people who were there other days as well, they came to Jesus, they followed Jesus, they stayed with Jesus because of what he did for them, because of what he was able to give them, because he fed them and he gave them something to put in their stomachs, to give them enough to eat at that particular time. But there's a problem because Jesus says this to them, hopefully it'll be on the next he says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. I am the living bread that comes down from heaven. And whoever eats this bread will live forever, Jesus says. See, lots of people were coming after him just because of what he could give them, just because of what he could do for them, just because of the miracles they knew that he was able to perform. But Jesus said, there's something that's more important than that to know. There's something that you should know about who I am. He says, I am the bread of life. He says, when you come to me, you don't need to worry about having enough for breakfast. You don't need to worry about having enough to eat before you go to bed. He says, there are things that are even more important than that. He says, I am the living bread. I am what God has sent to the world. And what does he say at the end? He says, whoever eats this bread will live forever. And you know, that's much better, isn't it, than being promised whatever we might be promised for breakfast or for lunch or for dinner. He's saying that whenever we come to him, whenever we trust him, whenever we put our faith in him, then we can know that we will be with him forever. And that's why he calls himself this. That's why he tells us that he is the bread of life. Well, you still have a couple of weeks of holidays left, don't you? Maybe two weeks before you go back to school. Two more weeks of holiday breakfast. I don't know whether you have a fry or they have toast and peanut butter, or they have something else. But whenever we're having our breakfast, let's remember what Jesus tells us, that he is the bread of life. Whoever eats this bread, he says, well, live forever. 
Okay, you're going to have an opportunity to go out now to, to KFC and to uh, learn a little bit more about Jesus and what God tells us uh, through his Bible. If you uh, have been before, you will know that we're straight out through this door and the hall is just immediately behind us and you'll see uh, some of the leaders coming in as well and you'll be more than welcome uh, to join them. So we'll go and we'll do that. this week of uh, Miss Violet McKelvey and uh, we want to remember Violet's family in particular as we come um, to our, our intercessions uh, shortly. Let's maybe just take a, a, a few seconds of, of silence and reflection before we come to our prayers and intercession. Let's do that now. Heavenly Father, as we bring before you our prayers for others this morning, we want to remember in the family of Violet McKelvey, we want to in particular pray for her niece Carol and other family members who have survived her. Lord, we give you thanks for her long and fulfilled life and we pray that you would help us to know your presence with us, particularly as we, we join together later this week and, and give you thanks for her life. Lord, this morning we also want to pause and and uphold the other families in our church family who have been bereaved over uh, past days uh, and weeks. We want to remember the McNally, the Neil, the Mackenzie and the Hughes family circles who have all experienced loss in, in these days. Father, we remember them in their time of loss and, and grief. And Father, we want to uphold them. We want to pray that you would help us to uh, encourage them and surround them. And, Lord, play our parts as their brothers and sisters in Christ at this particular time. Father, we pray that you would help them to know and to be reminded of your promise that we had thought about earlier through the promise, uh, through the Psalms. Lord, help them to know that as they dwell in the shelter of the Most High, that they really can rest in the shadow of, of the Almighty. Father, help them, we pray, to be able to, to say that you are their refuge, that you are their fortress that you are their God in whom they can continue to trust. Father, help them to pray to know what life is like in the, the shelter of the Most High, even in times and seasons such as this in life. Father, we pray that you help them to know what it really looks like and means to trust you, even as they grapple with the, the reality of, of loss and the situations that they find themselves in at this time. Father, in our prayer session this morning, we want to uh, pray for our Holiday Bible Club and for our youth nights that, that are just ahead of us. Father, we pray for uh, the leaders in particular who, who will do uh, a talk each morning and who will open up your word. We pray that you will help us to do that in ways that uh, the children would understand, in ways that would make sense, in ways that, that would uh, really point them uh, to Jesus. 
Father, we thank you for each and every member of the team. We thank you for uh, the preparation that has uh, gone into this week that is ahead of us. We thank you for all the, the work that has been uh, carried out so far. We thank you also for the team who, who will come and help us from the Christian Union, uh, the Ulster University. Thank you for their willingness and their enthusiasm and their commitment. And we pray for the entire team who will work together throughout this week. Lord, uh, continue to pray to bind us together. Continue to help us to know that you uh, can use us as you work out your plans and your purposes and all those who will uh, come this week. We pray too for the family service that we will join together for next Sunday. We, we pray that in particular that the, the kids and the families who will uh, be invited along will, will come. We pray that they will be encouraged and, and we pray that they will encounter you through your word. We pray also for the, the youth nights that we have uh, planned. We thank you for those who have said they're, they're coming along and we thank you for the opportunity just to to get together with some of the young people from this area. We, we pray that you would help them to, to feel at home. We pray that you would help them to enjoy the nights that we have planned. And we, we pray that you would help us to be able to share your word in, in a relevant way, in a way that really speaks to them, in a way that uh, speaks to their situation and uh, straight to their hearts, we pray. So Lord, all these things we trust you with, all these things we entrust to you, and all these things we pray that you would guide us with. In Jesus' name we ask it. I wonder what the first uh, seven things are that you would tell a stranger about yourself. I wonder what are some of the most important things to you that you would want someone else to know about. I wonder what's going through in your head at this very moment in time. Some of the things that you would introduce yourself with. Maybe they're things that include what your job is or was. Maybe. Uh, who is in your family, what your real passion is in life. I wonder what are those most important things that you would want someone else to know about you. I mentioned in a sermon a couple of months back that, that more than half of the world are on social media at this moment in time. Whether it's Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or something else that I'm too old now um, to know about or have an account for. But, you know, all of them give us an opportunity to do things like that. All of them give us an opportunity to uh, type up our bio or biography, things that we want to tell others about ourselves. Some people leave it blank. Some people put things in that are, are a little cryptic or, or have to be worked out. But anyone who, who has Twitter will know that you have 140 characters available to be able to describe yourself. 140 characters letters, spaces, question marks, and all the rest to be able to introduce yourself <coughs> to someone else. And you know, that's not a very, uh, that's not a, a very big amount of words or characters or spaces. And so you have to be selective. You have to choose what you're going to distill down to say about yourself. And whatever you choose would say a lot about you, wouldn't you? Whatever you would choose to tell others in just 140 characters would say a lot about your priorities, would say a lot about what you think is important, it would reveal a lot about what you want other people to know about you. Well, in the series we're going to look at over these next couple of months in, in Alexandra, we're thinking about things that, that are exactly that for Jesus, things that he has told us about himself. Just seven things that are among all of the others that we read in John's Gospel but seven important statements that Jesus makes about himself. The seven I am sayings of Jesus. Who really is Jesus? What does he really tell us about himself? What does he really want us to know about him? Well, these are seven sayings that help us to answer those questions. And today we're going to look at the first of those. I am the bread of life, Jesus says. And you know, as we think about these seven things, as we think about these seven pictures that Jesus gives, there's a, a real importance, isn't there, about Jesus being the one who tells us these things. Not Matthew, Mark, or Luke, or John, but Jesus who tells us these things himself. And you know, it's important for us because it helps us to know that as we open up God's word, as I or someone else stands from here and, and open up, opens up God's word each and every Sunday, it helps us to know that we are not 
speculating. Helps us to know that we are not just building on tradition, not reading the words of someone else and digesting it and repeating it for you. Helps you to know as you open up God's words each and every day that we do not have to guess what God is like. We do not have to speculate and wonder about who Jesus is and what he wants us to know about him. But it reminds us that as we open up God's word that we read from our Saviour himself. We read from the one whose desire is to be known by us. The one who has reached out and has taken the first step. The one who has come to us and who has made himself known. And so as we open up the Bible, we are reminded that this is not a riddle for us to solve. Instead, we are presented with a Saviour who uses this everyday, understandable, relatable images that he gives us, telling us who he is, why he has come, and what it means to follow him. And as well as these images, as well as the meanings behind these seven pictures that Jesus gives us, we have this really important message that, that underpins each and every one of them. And it's that Jesus uses these two words as he introduces each picture. I am. And it tells us that Jesus is not someone who can promise just to point us to God. Someone who is very wise and has accumulated a lot of wisdom and can say, look, I understand and, and I can show you the way to God. It's not who Jesus is. He's not a prophet with a high opinion of himself. But through these seven pictures, each time he shares them, he is reminding us, he is revealing himself as God himself. He is the Son of God. He is identifying himself with the great I am. Just as God came to speak, just as God came to reveal himself to Moses at the burning bush, what did he say? Exodus 3 tells us. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me. And they ask him, what is his name? And what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. That is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. And so Jesus uses these two words. Jesus uses this phrase not by accident, but to identify himself. To make this claim of huge significance as to who he is. That he is part of the only eternal reigning God. I am, Jesus says. I am, I am, I am. And so as Jesus makes these seven revealing statements, as he gives us these images of who he is kind of reminds us each time doesn't it that the, the option of, of sitting on the fence is not really available to us the option of saying well I don't know, I'm not sure I think I'll worry about that later is not really one that's left open for us is it? Whenever we hear what he has to say it becomes harder and harder for us to remain in that neutral position, doesn't it? It leaves us unable to look at Jesus as someone who, as I've said, is a, a well-intentioned teacher, someone who has accumulated a lot of wisdom, someone who said a lot of things which is worth following. Either Jesus is who he says he is, as the I am, or he's someone who is out to dupe us. And over the course of these Next, at seven, looks at John's gospel. As we look and we think about what Jesus says about himself, as we think about the significance of these claims that he makes, maybe that's something that goes through your mind. Maybe that's something that helps you to make your mind up about who you really think Jesus actually is. And so we come this morning to the first of these seven statements, the first of these pictures that Jesus gives us. He says, I am the bread of life. And as with everything else, these words of Jesus, they, they don't arrive in a vacuum. They don't just pluck them out of the air and think, okay, let's, let's talk about that uh, this morning. 
They come with the context, don't they? And here the context before our reading this morning was that 5,000 men, and no doubt even more women and children, maybe, maybe anything up to 20,000 people were fed. And they were fed miraculously, weren't they? There's no other way to describe that but five little loaves or bats and two small dry fish feed a crowd the size of a, a reasonable town in Northern Ireland, isn't it? There's no other way to describe that than a miraculous event. That's something that we cannot fathom, we could not work out, we could not really imagine for ourselves. And so what comes before this statement of Jesus, the context that he shares these words in, is that people are fed, is that people see things with their own eyes that they can barely believe, and is that their stomachs are filled, their physical hunger, their normal hunger, is satisfied. And Jesus does it miraculously with this little boy's lunch. And so here he has this perfect platform. Here he has this perfect illustration of what has just happened to be able to tell them what he tells them. I am the bread of life, Jesus says. What does he mean by that though? Well, let's, let's take a look at what he says. When Jesus says that he is the bread of life, he is laying to him to be the one that satisfies the one, the only one, who truly satisfies. And you know, this isn't really an implication that we have to, to work out for ourselves. We don't have to look at it from different angles or wet up. But Jesus says it, doesn't he? He says, whoever comes to me shall not hunger. And whoever believes in me will not thirst, he says. You know, in the build-up, the people have been fed, haven't they? They've got a meal that they wanted, uh, and they wouldn't have got any other way. But they would be hungry again, wouldn't they? The next day, however many hours later, they would be hungry again. But Jesus says, that's not the way it is with me. That's not the way it is with those who come to me. That's not the way it is whenever you believe in me, Jesus says. But whenever he says this, the people say, well, why don't you give us some evidence? Why don't you show us what you really mean? Why don't you vindicate yourself, Jesus? Why, why don't you do what Moses did and then we'll really know what you're all about? Because you see, these people, they're still talking about Moses. Why don't you do what he did? And if we're honest, sometimes we do that with God, don't we? Sometimes we, we want him. Sometimes we think we need him to prove himself to us, don't we? We think, well, if, if God does this for me, I'll, 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 I'll I'll be able to believe a little bit more. If, if God does this or that, well, well, I think that would really give me a reason to believe. It would give me a reason to, to trust in him. But what does Jesus say in, in verse 26? He says, very truly, I tell you, you're looking for me not because of the sign that I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. He's saying that the people didn't take this as a sign that would really point them to who he is. The people didn't take the fact that he's just miraculously provided for them. They didn't take that as an opportunity to have a true and a deep sense of faith in him. They were just happy for what had been done for them. They were just glad that their stomachs were filled and they thought maybe, maybe this man could do this sort of thing again. And that's how we're left, isn't it? Whenever we ask God to prove, our, to prove himself to us. Whenever we ask God to do something for our health, whenever we ask God to do something for our finances or our family or for something else, God fixing those things alone would never bring us into a relationship with him, would never give us enough to be able to have faith in him that would last. You know, I wonder if you've ever heard the advice that you, you should never go to the supermarket whenever you're hungry. You ever heard that said? Well, there are researchers in a, in a university in, in New York who really did want to see if that was a bad idea, that you shouldn't go to do your big shop whenever you're hungry. Here's a quote from, from what they found. It says, researchers found that people who have eaten all afternoon choose more high calorie foods in a simulated supermarket. And that those who were given a snack just before online shopping did the same. And in a real grocery store, shoppers bought a high ratio of high calorie foods to low calorie ones in the hours leading up to dinner time compared to earlier 
in the day. There we have it, you really shouldn't go to do your shopping on an empty stomach. Why is it? Because you start to think about all the things you think will satisfy your hunger. You start to think about all the things that it is that you really want, whenever it's getting close to dinner or just whenever you're hungry. <clears throat> do you ever wonder though if we do that maybe on a, a, a deeper level? Do you ever wonder if we do that maybe on a, in a way that's even more important than what we pick from test or Asda or wherever else we do our shopping? Wonder do we ever do that in life with things that, that really matter to us even more than those things? That as people that we are hungry for what really matters in life? That as people we are hungry for what will last? We're hungry for a, a true sense of peace or contentment or whatever it is we feel that, that we're missing. And because of that we look for ways to satisfy it, don't we? We look for lots of things that we think that will quench that thirst, that will satisfy that hunger. Maybe we do it in lots of ways. Maybe we do it in the decisions that we make and we know are not good for us. Maybe we do it in the things that we buy and we get them when we think we don't really need that, can't really afford that, that's not really going to satisfy me. See the group of people who were around Jesus that day, he made that point to them. He made that point on a, a much deeper level to those who heard it that day. He said that even after they ate the bread, even after they saw this miraculous thing that had been done, that they were going to be hungry again. And they kept looking for things that wouldn't satisfy. What did he say to them? He says, don't work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. Jesus said, you spend so much of your time, you give so much of yourself to looking for things that in the scope of eternity doesn't matter. And it won't last. You know, maybe sometimes we're guilty of doing the same. Things that we strive for, things that we long for, things that we spend our money on, hoping that they will begin to satisfy us. Jesus says that we spend time chasing after things that can only ever be short-term per replicas of the true satisfaction that he provides. And as Jesus makes this or extraordinary claim that he is the bread of life, he says that he is the one who satisfies that hunger. He makes the claim that he is the one who can quench that thirst. Why? Because he is the bread of life, he says. He makes the outrageous claim as he does elsewhere that he is the only thing that can satisfy the longings of our heart. And he says it's fine in me, Jesus says. He is the bread of life. And as well as being the one who satisfies, satisfies what else is he? He is the one who is completely essential. He identifies himself with this image and he, he makes another important point. He is essential for life itself. And you know, we all know how important food is for us, don't we? That maybe we've gone without food for a couple of hours or maybe we've had our dinner later than we normally do and, and we begin maybe to understand what, it, what it's like to go without food. What it's like to maybe be hungry, not just for a few hours, but be for a few days or even for longer. It's at times like that we get a little glimpse of how essential food is for us, of just how much we need it. You know, in a similar way, <clears throat> Jesus tells us that as the bread of life, he is the one who is essential for them. He says this in verse 33. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. You know, Jesus has talked a lot about meeting needs in this life. He has shown that he is the one who will meet needs in this life. He has shown it with maybe 20,000 people who have their stomachs filled. He, he understands what it means to have our needs met in this life. But as he talks about being essential, something else comes into view. Something else is what he wants us <clears throat> to think about. He wants us to think about eternity. See, John's Gospel, the book of John, is full of, of references to life and to death, contrast between life and death. And, and probably the best known is, is the best known verse in the entire Bible, isn't it? John 3.16. We have this contrast, don't we, between perishing and between eternal life. And in John's book alone, there are, there are 26 occasions 
where Jesus is the one who either identifies himself or is identified as this giver of life. This contrast between death and life. And here he talks about the one who can give eternal life. The contrast between death and eternal life. And what does he do? He makes this outrageous claim that he is the one who can provide that. That he is the one who offers that type of life. You know, we live in a, a time, don't we, where probably where people uh, look after themselves maybe the, the better than ever before. People who think more about looking after themselves. People who would be horrified with the three things that I showed on the screen earlier for breakfast. And we are, aren't we, as a, a people, as a society, but even as a world, we're, we're a lot more interested in getting fit or staying fit than ever before. We have all of these fitness programs with gym memberships with people who watch what they eat and, uh, and who have all sorts of different diets and ways of doing things. But you know, sometimes it leads us to a particular mindset, doesn't it? Sometimes it leads us to thinking uh, in a particular way to say that, you know, we need to look after ourselves. We need to look after these bodies. Why? Because this life is all there is. And we need to get the most we can out of it. We need to stretch it for as long as we can. Sometimes that's the mindset that we slip into, isn't it? Sometimes that's what others tell us and fill our minds with. And of course we should look after ourselves, shouldn't we? We should want to be healthy and, and make the right choices and we, we should want to, to look after the bodies that we've been given and, and look after our health and all those things. Of course we should. But we shouldn't be lulled into thinking that this life is all that there is. You know, the motto that a lot of people live by is that we should live for as long as we can and get as much as we can out of life because, because that really is all there is. But that's not what Jesus says here. That's not what he points us to. He doesn't think that this life is all that there is. He points to eternity. He points to an eternal God. He points us to the giver of life, to the giver of eternal life. He says that there is an eternity to be spent either with God or without him. An eternity to be lived either with the giver of life or without the giver of life. He says that he is essential. He is the one who repairs what sin has broken with the giver of life, the giver of eternal life. And as he will do elsewhere in these seven statements, he makes an exclusive claim to the only one who could do that and who could offer that. As Jesus is the bread of life, he, he's not like the trip to the supermarket. He's not like whenever we see that wall filled with bread and we have our pick. We choose what we like and we discard what we don't. We choose what we'll have this week and maybe what we'll have next week. That's not what he is. He makes this extraordinary claim to be the exclusive way to life eternal. To life of the giver of life. And for that he is essential. And finally, he's told us that he is the one who satisfies us. He is the one who is essential. And as John paints this picture, as John tells us the account of what happened that day, what is it? It's crammed with the crowd's reaction, isn't it? It's not just a speech from Jesus. It's not a monologue that goes out from Jesus. But instead, it's a conversation, isn't it? A conversation that goes to and fro, an interaction that we hear between Jesus and the crowd who is around him. We're not left to wonder what they might have said or what they thought or what they asked. As Jesus introduces this truth about himself, about eternal life, how does the crowd respond? What do they ask? They say, Jesus, what must we do to do the works that God requires of us? Their immediate thought is, Jesus, tell us how we can earn this. Tell us how we can work for these type of things that you are talking about. And our minds often work like that, don't they? Whenever we're offered a, a deal that seems too good to be true. Whenever an email comes and, uh, and tells us that someone in a faraway place wants to give us lots of money. Whenever a stranger offers to pick up and carry our bags, we think, hmm, I'm not sure about that. And all those times and circumstances, we're probably right to be suspicious and to be cautious, aren't we? An instinct 
kicks in that wants to protect ourselves. And here something even more than that is going on. Here this Jewish religious mindset, one that is based on what they can bring to God, what God requires of them, well here it's laid there. They want to know that if they shouldn't work for food that will spoil and things that don't really matter in eternity, well then what should they work for? Jesus, tell us how we should work. Their presumption is that they would work for God and that then God would work for them. That's how they understood it. Sometimes we think in similar ways, don't we? Sometimes we think a little bit more like that than maybe we would want to imagine. One which makes us think that the, this bread of life, it's only on offer to some people. It's only on offer to people who will work hard for it. That's only on offer to people who will earn it over a long time. That's only on offer to people who will bring things to God that he once brought to him. The offer is open, we tell ourselves, as long as we put enough on the plate on a Sunday morning. The offer is open to us, we say, well, as long as we live a good moral life that, that will please God enough when it comes time. The offer is open, we tell ourselves, if, if others can see us, being good living, if others can see us living this sort of life, well, well the offer is, is open then. But as we finish, what does, what does Jesus make it clear that our response needs to be? What does he say to people that ask this sort of question? Jesus says, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. Believing is what's required of us. Putting our belief in Jesus is what's asked of us. Trusting in Jesus more than ourselves is what we need to know about the bread of life. And it's a believing, a type of belief which determines how we live. That's the sort of belief that Jesus is talking about. I might say that I believe in, in fair trade. I might say that that sort of thing makes a massive impact in the world around us. I continue to go to the shops and buy the cheapest things that I can. I don't really believe in that sort of thing, do I? Jesus says that as we believe in him, the type of belief that he is talking about, well then God is at work in us. God is changing us from the inside out. Changed by putting our faith in him. That's what he asks from us. Changed by not trusting in ourselves. Not thinking about the types of things that we can do for God. That type of trust in Jesus. And we're changed by him, aren't we? We're changed by him working in us, maybe bit by bit, maybe little bit by little bit. But we are changed by him as we put our trust in Jesus. And what is it that we can trust in? Who is it that we can believe in? We can believe in the one who tells us that he is the bread of life. The bread of life who satisfies us. The bread of life who satisfies those deepest longings of our heart. And the bread of life who is essential if we are to know life with him forevermore. And the one who can make that promise as he finishes. Whoever comes to me, Jesus says, I will never drive him away. I am the bread of life. Well, let's reflect that. Let's respond to those words as we sing our, our closing uh, praise. The words will be on the screen. The Lord is my salvation. Let's stand as we sing together.
pray as we finish. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, both now and forevermore. Amen. But folks, we'll, we'll continue just to, to leave in the same way that we have been, just those in the gallery. They'll be coming down first, followed by this half of the ground floor, and this half, if anyone has uh, a child or a young person in KFC, maybe one pair can go out and collect them just before uh, you go. Thank you.